Well, open your Bibles once more to Matthew chapter 6. It's good to stand before you again to open the Word of God, and I'm always thankful to be able to, to do that. I'm always thankful to be able to, to be standing, amen. amen, to be able to be together, um, to be worshiping, and just so that you know, uh, I've come, I come across this often, and I came across this this week in my schooling, um, in some conversations that we were having, um, and often we refer to worship, right, when we think of music, right? But that's not really the only time that we worship. This is worship. Opening your Bibles is worship. Being together in fellowship under the name of the Lord Jesus is worship. Where our hearts are turned to in the moment, uh, wherever we are, we could be worshiping. But music is praise. It's an expression of our worship. It's a, a vessel that we use in order to worship God. But years ago, um, probably eight years ago, I remember Emily telling me, like, I, I get much more from a, a sermon than the music. Like, the, the music could not be there at all, and I would, I would get more from the sermon. And eight years ago, I was the opposite, right? That's how God has changed this, this heart as well. God, God changes us. But we, we have different ways of expressing our worship. And this is one of them. Opening the Word of God. Seeing the Word of God. Being taught. Learning the Word of God. Loving the Word of God. Using the Word of God. So this morning we return for the second time to the Lord's Prayer. And the last week we were able to see the first part of the Lord's Prayer, verse 9 through 10. I'll remind you, we're going through the Sermon on the Mount, um, the Sermon of, of our Lord Jesus there in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And this morning in part 2, we pick up here in verse 11. But step back for a moment with me into last week. What was it that we saw in prayer last week? We saw that this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, as we know it, is really a pattern of prayer. Right? It's a, it's a pattern of prayer. It's a template of sorts for us to use in our prayer life. It is not a hard and fast rule that we must be able to pray this prayer. This is not the prayer that should consume all of our prayer life, for it is a pattern of prayer. Our Lord gives us this prayer and says, pray like this, like this. Okay, a template. He teaches us to pray. We must be taught to pray, we saw, because um, we in and of ourselves will fall back on selfish prayers and worldly prayers and We will pray um, in a way that is not honoring to God. We will fall back on that. So we must be taught. Really, we must be reminded to pray. We must be reminded what to pray and how to pray. And we saw that in all that we do as Christians, we are to be renewing our minds. To be renewing our minds is to be reminded, is to be taught is to be shown by God how to do something and to commit that to our memory and then commit that to our practice. So we are growing in Christ. We, we learn the right way. We learn how he wants us to think. And then we put that into action. We saw um, through Romans 12, 1 and 2, to not be conformed to this world. That's what Jesus said leading into this passage. Don't pray like the Pharisees. Don't don't pray like the hypocrites who love to stand in the streets, who love to stand in the synagogues, and they, they make these loud prayers with big words and they repeat. Don't pray like that. Pray like this. Don't be worldly in your prayers. Pray like this. Renew your mind. Renew your prayer. 
Thus, this template reminds us how to pray. We saw that this prayer, uh, this Lord's Prayer as we know it, is to remind us to whom we pray. Our Father, who is in heaven. That's the address. We pray to our Father. It reminds us where He dwells. It reminds us of what kind of people we are. We are not people of this world. We are a heavenly people. We belong somewhere else. And then we saw three of the seven petitions. There are seven petitions that make up the rest of that prayer. We address our prayer to the Lord, to our, to our Father in heaven. And then we have these seven petitions. We saw three of those. The first was that we want God's name to be hallowed. We want it to be holy. We want our lives uh, in our lives and in the world, we want his name to be separate. Hallowed be thy name. We secondly want his kingdom to come. We are not the kind of people who have mixed messages. We have one mission. That is to see the Lord's kingdom come. It's the gospel shared. That's the good news. It's people's lives being transformed by the good news. And the third petition was... Ultimately, that we want the Lord's will to be done in our life and on earth as it already is being done in heaven. Okay, we saw those three. And if you need a refresh on those, those are online. I'll take this moment to remind you we have that that available, that capability um, on our website and our YouTube page. So this morning we move into the fourth petition. And it's the one that probably most of you are thinking about at this 1030 hour. What are we going to have for lunch? The petition is this in verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. So a question that comes to my mind when when we study this phrase, what are we talking about? What are we talking about when we ask for this? Are we just asking for our food? Or is there something much deeper than that? We're asking for the Lord to give us. So the answer to that question is that we're asking for the Lord to give us everything that we need. The word is provision. That he would be our our provision. That he would give us what we need. We know from the Lord when he's being tested in the wilderness that he says man cannot live by bread alone, but off of every word that comes from the mouth of God. Which is really just a quote from Deuteronomy 4. He's using scripture to fight the temptation and he's using scripture to to remind himself. I don't just need food. I need other things, too. So the mentality behind this prayer is more so, give me today what I need. Give me today what I need. It includes everything from food to the words to say in conversation to energy to accomplish what he has in store for us today and everything in between. I'm sure we can think of a laundry list of so much more. We don't know what's in store for us in a single day, right? And it's probably better that we don't, or else we'd, we'd probably just stay in home. We'd, we'd just stay inside. We'd stay at home. We don't know what's in store for us today, but remember, at this point in this prayer, what have we already prayed? Your will be done. Your kingdom come. Let it not be that my kingdom advances today. Let not my will advance today, but let your will advance today. Let your kingdom come today. So in all that we need from food to energy to words, God will be our provision. Again, the point is, the point is we saw last week in this prayer, it's our purpose of prayer. It's our purpose of prayer, to lean on God. 
This prayer is nothing but looking up to heaven and wanting to see heaven come down by kingdom, by will, by food, to the end of it, through being delivered. We want to see heaven come down. So we're leaning on God. We're not leaning on ourselves. So, if this prayer is indeed a template of our prayer and a reminder of how to pray, a reminder of how to pray, to whom we pray, and to what we pray, we're praying for ourselves, our, our, our little kingdom to diminish, and God's kingdom to grow. This fourth petition, give us today our daily bread, this fourth petition reminds us again, yet again, that we need him. I fear that we must be reminded of this more than we already are. Because how many of us just go to the pantry and pick up something to eat? How many of us can just roll up to a literally roll up to a restaurant and get food. Whereas when Christ sent his disciples out and that first church was growing, they didn't know where their next meal was coming from. They didn't have a Bible, a New Testament like we do, to lean on the words of Jesus. But yet... How many of you have more than one? We know where our food can come from. We have all the resources to eat physically and spiritually. And yet, how many of us pray this prayer at the beginning of our day? Lord, give us what we need. And help what we don't need to diminish. Let us not live in excess. The fifth petition is this. It says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. What is this to remind us of? And why do we need to be reminded to pray for forgiveness? If I'll remind you a few if we go back a few weeks, maybe even a few months, I, I've lost track of when we started this. The, the scope, the outlook of the Sermon on the Mount is that it is a discipleship discourse. Jesus is teaching his disciples overall. This is what a disciple of mine looks like. Not that you're going to hit it perfectly, but this is what we're aiming for, Right? This is what we're aiming for. This is the standard. This is the bar. Jesus is standing before the people, this large crowd, teaching them, really laying out what it means to be a disciple. So we, as Christians, are reminded here that we're not better than anyone else, right? And daily, we are in need of forgiveness, and one might interject, wait, I thought we were already forgiven. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good interjection. That's a good interjection. That's a good thought to put, uh, to put there. One might interject, Christ died once and for all. I was forgiven of my sin the moment I submitted to the cross. To which I would say, yes and amen. You are. You're exactly right. However... At that moment that you submit your life to the Lord saying, I'm going to follow Jesus with my life. You must also repent. I saw a quote yesterday that uh, is from a, a well-known pastor. He said the the uh, most often missed component of our gospel is repentance. We tell people the good news. This is great news. Look at this good news. Look at Look at how amazing this is. And we don't want to turn them away. 
We don't want them to be scared. We don't want them to think that we're holier than thou by saying, in order to get this, you must forsake your old life. In order to follow this, you must repent of your sin. Admit that you're in need of a savior. And stop walking that way and walk this way towards this. Following the words of Christ. We forget that part. For whatever reason. You must lay down your life and pick up a new life. It's, it's not some righteous life that you try to muster. This isn't paying a thousand dollars to the TV preacher on TV. So that you can have more peace in your life. That's not the kind of life that Christ decided for us to live. That's not the kind of life that Christ came and died for us to have. It's to follow Him. Through His Word. Forsaking your old life. Laying down your life and picking up Christ's. So, in this prayer, we're called to remember the forgiveness that is given at the cross. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts. He did, and he is, and he will. And I want to, this came up in our, uh, in our men's group just a few weeks ago, and I think we talked about it at our, our Thursday night as well. That, and I want, to, I want to remind you of this doctrinally, that Christ is not still on the cross. Right? Christ is in heaven. He ascended into heaven. He's not still on the cross. And every time you sin, you do not drive another nail into him. You're not crucifying him again. He has been crucified. And then he rose from the dead. And then he ascended. And he will come once more to judge the world and to return for his people. But this is what it reminds us. 1 John 1, 8 through 2, verse 1. It says this. If we say, this is to Christians. This letter was written to Christians, to a church. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. There are actually denominations that believe in this life, on this side of heaven, we can attain sinlessness. That's your position in heaven. But on earth, you're, you're not sinless. And if you use the Bible as your only word of authority and source of life, John tells us right here, the Apostle John tells us right here, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, which you will, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Daily, we confess our sin. Maybe even multiple times a day. We live a humble life. That's part of being humble. That's part of humility. That's part of the humility as a Christian. Is knowing that we are not holy. Jesus said. Uh, someone came to Jesus and said. Good teacher. Good teacher. And he said, don't you know that there's no one good but God? It's part of our humility is remembering that I need God to forgive me. I need God's grace today. I need his mercy. And to readily admit, I've offended your name. I have dishonored you. Forgive me. And you don't need a priest to do this. John tells us. You have an advocate. That is Jesus Christ. You have an advocate with the Father. That is Christ Jesus. You come to Him. 
You confess to him. You ask forgiveness. And in the moment you do, forgiven. He's quick to forgive, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. The moment you remember whose blood has paid the price for your debt with God, you are forgiven. Now, in turn, when you remember whose blood paid your debt to God for your sin, what does that do? What does that do? What does that allow us to do? What application of that do we have on earth? Well, one, I think it brings joy. I think it brings peace and relief and happiness. You need to pick me up in the day. Just remember whose blood bought your sin. Just remember what position you have in heaven with your father. It's the greatest gift ever given. But what else does it do? Well, it allows you to continue this prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those debts against us. Right? When we pray this, it reminds us about the grace that we receive and the forgiveness that we have received and then allows us to forgive our debtors. This is so important if you have your Bibles open, look at verse 14 and 15. He says, he expounds this section. He expounds this section on forgiveness. He says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, verse 14, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And I've heard many folks try to explain this away. Yeah, well, you don't know what they did to me. It was horrible. It was beyond belief. To which Jesus says, it might have been devastating, but what you did to me was worse. And I forgive you. Forgive them. It doesn't change this truth. We can put it like this. If you know true forgiveness from God, you can then in turn forgive anyone. As hard as it is, as hard as it will be, the power is in the blood. The truth is still there, right? In fact, if you want forgiveness from God, you must forgive other people, verse 14 and 15 says. It is true that devastating things can happen to us in our life that have led someone to be convicted of a crime. And it is true that that person may still have a course of action to follow, right? Just because you forgive someone doesn't get them out of jail, right? They still have a course of action they have to follow. But can you forgive them? Absolutely. I've heard this, and in fact, I've been told this, like for myself. You need years in therapy to work through these problems. No, you don't. The blood is right here. The truth is right here. The work that I have to do is about 18 inches. From my head to my heart. I have to believe it. I have to receive it. I have to put it in action. I have to let it cover me. I have to let the blood of Christ wash over me. The purpose of this prayer is to remind us again that we need God. There is nothing else that we need nor nothing else that we as Christians should want other than more of God. When we have God, 
We have it all. But you can see that this forgiveness has been given to us through Christ. And if we don't have him, if we don't have Christ, we don't have forgiveness. Can you see, can you see that forgiveness is our good news? The gospel means good news. Gospel means good news. That's what churches are to be about, about spreading this gospel message, right? What is the gospel? What is this good news? That's a question that every church should continually ask themselves so that they know what their mission is, so that they know what their message is. What is this good news that you offer me? What is this good news that you bring to me? Well, it's forgiveness. This is the heart of the gospel right here. If you don't have forgiveness of your sin, you don't have God. If you don't have forgiveness of your sin, you cannot stand justified before God. If you don't have forgiveness of sin, you don't have heaven. I'd continue in that lane, but I I have to move on. Forgiveness is our good news. It's not wellness. I don't know how many times I've heard people, you can be more, you can be better. You'll be healthier as a Christian. That's not our good news. It's not that you're going to be more healthy or even spiritually sound. Come find religion. Come work your spiritual muscles. That's not our good news either. Our good news is not even that you can finally belong to a community that gets you. Right? I hear that today. So many young people that will go to CrossFit to find community. Why don't you turn your church into something more like CrossFit so that then there can find a true community? Make it more exciting. Make it more lively. Right? That's not our good news. And our good news is not that you can finally be free from all of your hardships and suffering. Our good news is that you can be forgiven of sin. That you can stand righteous before God. That you can have a relationship with God. That your guilt and shame that you feel can be washed away through the blood of Christ. So I'm going to spend the remainder of our, of our time looking at that, and you're going to have to forgive me. We're not getting through this prayer again this week, so there will be a, a part three um, to look forward to that. But I, I, I want you to get this. I don't want to rush through this. It hit me this morning that we, we need to slow this down at this point because this is the heart of the gospel. And if we don't understand this, We don't understand the good news. We don't understand what it means to be a church if we don't understand this. So if you have your Bibles, come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So the question, just for a few minutes that we want to spend looking at this, is what, where does this forgiveness of sin come from? What comes from the blood of Christ, yes, but if Christ stayed dead, then he was just another man. We, if Christ stayed dead, he was just another Buddha. He was another Gandhi. So forgiveness of sin, this is what I want to show you this morning. Forgiveness of sin comes, uh, the, the debt is paid on the cross, but it's sealed the moment that he rose, that he came back to life, that he defeated death. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul hits a section here in, in this chapter where he's underlining the gospel. And actually he starts chapter 15 by stating this. 
Now, I would remind you, brothers, and if you were with us on Thursday night, um, the word, you'll add all, add all foy, brothers and sisters, okay? This is to the group. This is to everyone. I'll remind you, brothers, I'll remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, in which you are being saved if you hold fast to these words. And then he starts detailing the gospel. This is what the gospel is. Well, you'll find in those next few verses, and this is how I sum it up with my children. This is a great, great way to remember the gospel message. He came. He died. He rose. And he's coming back. Four points. My son's giving me a thumbs up. Good job, Dad. You remembered it. <laughs> he came. He died. He rose. He's coming back. And some folks were having trouble with that whole resurrection bit. Some people said, one cannot be raised from the dead. That's crazy talk. Okay? It's impossible. So you look at verse 14 in chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. Paul says, If then Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. Whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. So what's the moment, what's the moment in our gospel message that's good news? Christ rose from the dead. That's the hinge point that even becomes a stumbling block to most people. He rose from the dead. You're telling me that a man came back to life? Yes, I am. You're telling me that that strangely supernatural event is the thing that makes me right with God if I believe it? Yes. Yes, I am. You're telling me that you are basing your whole life, your whole foundation for everything, you're going to base on that one supernatural, strangely to believe event? Yes, I am. You're going to give up everything? Yes, I am. You're going to walk a whole different lifestyle. You're going to follow the words of Christ. Yes, I am. You're going to take in persecution. You're going to lose your friends and family because of this. Yes, I am. If Christ has not been raised... Our preaching has been in vain. We've been preaching. We've been believing for no reason. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, we have nothing to stand on. Why? For if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you're still in your sins. My friends, Christ came to save sinners. This is a trustworthy saying, deserving of full acceptance, Paul tells Timothy. Christ came to save sinners, of which I am the foremost. Christ came to pay a debt that we owe. Romans 5 says, While you were still dead in your sins, Christ died for you to pay your sin. This is where we get this last petition, and we'll, we'll have to come back to it. But the last petition in the prayer is, Deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the evil one. Well, the evil one's really not even Satan. The evil one is sin. You need to be delivered from it. You need power over it. Crush it, Cain, or it will devour you, God said. It's crouching at your door. Kill it. So how does one know that you are a Christian? Is it because you tell them? Is it because a card that you carry around with you or a bumper sticker you have? No. 
Christ said, they will know you by your love. They will know you by your love. This goes back to forgiveness. Okay, watch how this ties in here. First John tells us, anyone who does not show love, or anyone who does not love, does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the payment, the covering for our sin. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And the world will agree with that and gather around the campfire and sing Kumbaya until the cows come home. Just got to love like Jesus. Love like Jesus, man. What does it mean to love like Christ? What does it mean to love like Christ? Romans 5, 8. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Love looks like death. It looks like dying to yourself and living to Christ. The only way you can do that is to know and to receive that your sins have been forgiven because Christ died for them and then defeated them and left them in the grave. They're there. They're not with you anymore. If you believe that. If you hinge your life on that. So the question is, do you believe that? Does this prayer remind you of that truth? Forgive us our debts so that we can forgive the debts of those who have sinned against us. Because Christ has forgiven us and affected us this deeply, we are ready and willing to forgive anyone. Again, does this mean that everyone is left off the hook? No. There's still a course of action, but you can forgive them in your heart. You don't have to hold a grudge. You don't have to be bitter. You don't have to be angry. You can let it go. Because nothing matters more than Christ. We give grace and mercy just as we have received it. The amount of grace that we receive through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we give away. And if we don't, verse 14 and 15 in Matthew 6 says, Our Father in heaven will not forgive us. And it's less of a scare tactic. This is not a scare tactic. You better. Or this is less of that and more of a a witness. If you can't forgive, if you're having trouble forgiving, maybe you haven't received in full what Christ has done for you. Christians dwell, dwell in the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. He is the lamb who was slain. That's their song in heaven. He is the lamb who was slain. He died, defeating death. When he rose from the grave, he is our only source of true joy and he is our only source of true peace with God through his death, sealed by his resurrection. I just want you to listen to this as we close. Romans 5, verse 9 through 11. It says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, Shall we be saved by his life? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
through whom we have now received reconciliation. Most gracious Lord, we remember your sacrifice from here on out of this time together. We ask you to clean us through your blood, that you would give us grace through your blood, that you would help us, Lord, to be conformed to Christ rather than to the world through reminding us of the blood that was shed and the power of the resurrection. Lord, and we declare these things here in just a moment through coming together to the table. And we ask, Father, that they would speak power, that they would be power in our life. Not to be weighed down by sin, but to remember that you defeated our sin and paid for it. And that we can now live in abundance of joy, remembering our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that this would go forth and it would reap a harvest, Lord, that you may have the glory of hearts being changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing.